Hey folks, Steve here with another Nations in Arms video. In this video, we'll be starting off the 1805 Grand Campaign uh, scenario in earnest here. Um, we had an intermission video from a while back, um, and, and I'm sorry that we've had such a gap here, but the, we had some things get in the way. Um, I had taken a little bit of, of a break during that intermission um, to play Prussia's Glory. Had some fun with that as sort of a... a changing up of the pace a little bit, and uh, obviously uh, I still have a lot of busy school and life, work, family stuff that has kept me from getting back to this specific game, uh, just because each turn, there's just a lot more to it than, say, Precious Glory or, or something else. Um, so I kind of had to put this on the back burner for a little bit, but uh, this is really the big show, guys. This is the, the great big scenario that could last um, I think nine years, it goes up to 1814 or the end of 1814, so nearly nine years. Um, pretty long scenario, and uh, you know we, we covered a lot of the different mechanics in the intermission video, so I'm not going to lean too hard into that stuff. I spent like an hour talking through all of that in the intermission video, so if you want to watch that, please do that before watching this one. Um, a couple of minor fixes. I did have to make some adjustments to... The, uh, the track here, because the scenario information actually does stipulate that Austria is at 10 uh, and Russia is at 9, um, what do you call it, alliance credit. So uh, I had calculated my own starting based on what I knew, but I, apparently uh, maybe there's some assumed like Britain has paid for uh, <clears throat> some additional bumps up to that. So that's kind of where that's at. Um, yeah, so with that, uh, I think we can go ahead and get started, um, and let's talk about the strategic situation uh, before we start pulling chits. So <clears throat> as it stands right now, if, and you know, if you're familiar with the War of the Third Coalition, none of this should be terribly surprising. Um, France has control of a great deal of its quote-unquote Grand Empire territory. There's a couple of places that they, they do not yet control, like Neuchâtel, uh, the papacy down here. Um, but very generally, you can see that they control quite a bit um, outside of their home core territory. They've annexed a number of places, and I've marked that with my trusty uh, home, uh, not homemade, uh, but but sort of home solution for uh, game support, which is these discs that I bought a long time ago. Um, and the blue represents French-controlled areas, black, Prussia, gray for Austria, um, and it's very different from the previous scenarios where, you know, Austria doesn't have that many holdings left uh, in the, you know, Holy Roman Empire territories. And in fact, Prussia has a lot more um, allies or, or vassal territory there. So uh, France is at war with Britain uh, and Austria and Russia. So, the, so those big three. Prussia is safely neutral for the moment, as they were. And then uh, the Ottomans are neutral. And Spain is actually currently allied to the French. So uh, there is, in fact, some stuff going on down here where uh, the British are blockading. Uh, there's a couple of, you know, detachments and things here that isn't super important yet. Um, but basically, Spain will be looking to invade Portugal here in the near term. Uh, it's likely what's to happen. And then uh, the, the real big shows are going to be probably in Germany and Italy, as they tend to be. Uh, the Austrians have a sizable army in Venice. The French have their own near uh, Milan. And then in Germany, there's a, a scattering of units here, uh, but a pretty hefty Austrian army here with Mack. And there's some scattered French armies up here, but importantly, the totally massive Grand Armée is in the Boulogne camp, uh, and it is a scary stack of French units. It's just gnarly. I don't think we've seen a stack quite as potently strong <clears throat> uh, in any scenario until now uh, with Napoleon himself. So the the obvious move in terms of the strategic situation is, you know, obviously there, there will be fighting in Italy. And then as the French player, you kind of have a decision to make. Do you make this really, really risky waste of time gambit trying to take control of the channel and take Napoleon into Britain, I, I don't think that's a terribly great idea, honestly. Um, it's a fun exercise if you want to try to solitaire it, but I don't even want to waste my time trying to do it. 
I don't think mathematically it works out very well. So the, the alternative then is to send Napoleon to reinforce uh, Germany, basically, and be prepared to face off against Mac and the rest of those guys. And, you know, this, if you're only playing this scenario as a, like a one-year scenario, this is the son of Austerlitz campaign. So you could, if you wanted to, set all this stuff up and basically just play a year's worth of the game as a shorter scenario. That option is there for us. If for some reason we think the game has gone really weird off track, we could just stop and, and re-rack for a different scenario. Um, but it was a lot of work to put all these units where they're supposed to be, so I, I don't necessarily want to do that. Um, so that's probably what the French are going to need to do. And they have a really good card to do it with. So they have this Balone Camp card. An army commanded by Napoleon may be activated during a French round without an activation marker. So basically he gets to move and then not get an activation marker at all, which is like a free activation, basically. May move twice its movement factor, which is important, and may engage in battle without an attrition check. So knowing that, you know, we would ordinarily activate Napoleon twice in a given turn, this allows us to get a freebie. And it's not even a forced march. Uh, the forced march card is another card that that can kind of let you do something similar, but you suffer attrition for it. The French also have this card. And basically it means that wh whenever we want, if we're going to fight an enemy army and they want to escape, they're basically probably not going to be able to when we play this card. So this is, again, the like the opportunity to get the drop on an enemy army uh, when we want to. The uh, Coalition, by comparison, only have the... Nelson card, which despite it being red and an R card, uh, this is sort of a rata. If they ever republish this game, this card would be probably made a different color uh, and have a different designation. Um, but by scenario rules, they, they, they do have this card. Basically, it just you know, allows Nelson to, to certainly win a naval battle and then he dies. Um, so uh, kind of, you know, I think the balance of the cards is in the, in the French player's favor to start here. Um, so, you know, in, in this turn, what I would expect the French player to try to do is uh, get control of the papacy, get that into the Grand Army, uh, Grand Empire, I should say, geez. Um, figure out what's going on in Italy, you know, ideally win that conflict. Pull Napoleon here, you know, get an Austerlitz victory. And really what we need to be able to do is get into Austria. And, and from a, like, land, continent perspective. They're the only power that we're really fighting in earnest. So we're going to be consecrated, concentrated on the Austrians, and we'll probably, like in history, I think it was Solt that uh, Napoleon left behind in the balloon camp. Like, we'll leave a couple guys behind to make sure the British don't get um, don't get too bold, but we'll, we'll take the majority over, and we'll probably do well there. The Spanish will probably go ahead and try to invade Portugal. I'm not too terribly worried about that. Um, the real key thing is, and this is kind of like the test of this game that I've been waiting a while for, in neither the War of the First Coalition or the Second Coalition did I ever feel like any power was really in danger of being knocked out, period. Um, they just may, they were never really conquered besides some special uh, diplomacy mechanics where the Prussians and the Spanish left early. It was always via that, never like, hey, you, you conquered Austria and they, you get the peace clauses. We've really not done that. And what I worry and what I, I hope I can validate is that the game actually, like, it's conceivable that we can actually get into, uh, you know, Vienna and and uh, actually, like, cause that um, conquer state to occur, right? Like, I, I, I'm going to have to double check how that works with the credit system because... The game would say, like, you know, you conquer a certain number of, of territories, like, they will they will have to surrender. But if you're playing with the Alliance credit, does that even matter? And I, I will have to look at that. Um, I'm going to play with both of them, you know, being possible, if only because that seems to make sense to me. But anyway, if for some reason I feel like Napoleon can't actually conquer Austria, let's say he does reasonably well, the rest of his forces do reasonably well, it would probably mean that either... I'm doing something wrong, or, or the game just has a hard time making that historical result happen. I'm not worried about that, but it is something I'm going to be watching for because, again, a, as it's happened so far, I haven't really seen that occur. Uh, we've seen, in previous scenarios, armies kind of fight themselves down to the nubs, and, and, and nothing ever being 
truly momentously um, decisive because by the time you have el totally eliminated an army, it's very feasible that it's like fall or winter and, and it's over and they rebuild their army again with all their production. So that I'm going to have to, you know, gauge and, and see how we go. Um, in terms of the initiative, the French player has the initiative, so they're going to get to pick their chit. I will probably pick the four chit so we know that Napoleon's going to move um, the, the extra number of times needed. And then um, the uh, as for the coalition, I'm not sure there's a whole lot that they can do other than, uh, you know, in Italy to contest and fight back against the French. Uh, maybe the British will try to help against the uh, the Spanish. That seems like an obvious thing to do. And then um, the one other, th the Russians obviously need to come down and reinforce. So they're going to be trying to, to, as quickly as they can, get down into uh, Austrian territory to help. They'll need to do that. <clears throat> There's one special thing that the Austrians are constrained by, which is they have some some big dummy rules where the uh, Austrian army of the Rhine, which is the, the one uh, with Mac there in Salzburg, uh, <clears throat> right here, uh, they have to move to besiege the fortress of Redisbon uh, until it falls, then move through Munich to besiege Ulm after Ulm has been besieged at least once. The army has no restrictions. So there's going to be like, there's a timer right? Mac's going to go get Radisbone. He's going to move through Munich. He's going to go to Ulm, where we do have a few units. But by then, Napoleon will probably be coming up, and, and they'll probably do very well against Mac in that case. But this is to kind of make sure that you still get kind of an Austerlitz thing, where maybe you might say, screw Radisbone and just go right for Ulm or something, but the game's going to make sure that you have a speed bump there, <clears throat> which just helps the historical narrative, I guess. You could maybe throw those those rules away if you wanted to see, you know, if you really wanted to go off the beaten track and see what happens, you could just ignore those rules. The other one is that the Austrian army of Italy has to move to besiege the fortress of Mantua. So if they're in Venice, go into Mantua. Um, and uh, after they've been besieged, Mantua has been besieged at least once, then they can move kind of wherever. Um, now, I don't know what happens if, like, they never get a chance to besiege Malt, uh, Mantua because Messina kicks their butt and then chases them or does whatever it is. Like, I, I don't know what happens there, but um, we'll, we'll deal with that if it comes up. The other special thing is there's Prussian unpredictability. So if Prussia joins the war on either side, uh, she cannot automatically move her forces outside of Prussia. But each diplomacy phase, you can roll a six, uh, a d6, if on a result of six, then, then uh, Prussia can move their forces wherever desired for the rest of the scenario. Otherwise, they have to stay in Prussia. Those restrictions are lifted in the spring of 1806, which all that, all that really means is um, even if the coalition gets lucky and pulls Prussia into the war, there's only a small chance of it being ahistorical and having the Prussians join up. Now, there's a whole interesting sort of historical story about Prussia being careful of entering the war, and then they eventually did at probably, like, not really great timing in the big scheme of things, and they were defeated, obviously, by, by the French. Um, this, this does represent that, so, like, it's not totally saying, like, Prussia can't be touched until 1806 when it officially did, but it does make it uh, low likelihood that the Prussians will do anything but what they did historically. So there's still a chance, but it's a small chance. So if they join the coalition, hey, great, but they're, they're very likely not going to be able to leave Prussia anyway. Um, but that still gives Britain the incentive to try to pull Prussia in, which they're going to need to do. Like they, they will want to either bring Prussia in, or France is just going to declare war on them because they want to. Um, there's a good reason to uh, to do it, so I could see that going either way. So I think, you know, Prussia will be in it exactly when we'll, we'll come up to diplomacy and, and chance, and then whether or not France decides to push the issue. But there, I have to imagine the French are going to spend their entire campaign year of summer, fall, and winter trying to knock Austria out so that come the spring of 1806, they can be talking about invading Prussia 
and, and doing all of that stuff. Um, so there you go. There's, there's the sort of the actual scenario, the strategic situation. Uh, we know how the mechanics work. Now we know what the situation is. We can start to play it. So what I'm just going to do again, uh, the French are going to say that they're playing the uh, Empire Land 4 chit to start. Everything else will go in the cup. And uh, I'll go ahead and play that shit. There's only a few units, again, that are a few stacks on the map that are actually going to move during this uh, this activation, but it gets us started. Okay, here we are after the first uh, activation. So we did uh, send our uh, friendly guy down here, uh, Gouvion, sans something or other. <laughs> Uh, he moved, extended move into Rome and is sitting on it. This will mean that the papacy will be conquered at the end of the year, assuming he can control that for the next couple of turns. This made sense to get in there. Um, and then we moved uh, Messena into Mantua. So when the uh, Austrians come, they're going to have to fight the French Army of Italy, um, it, it could be a tight battle because I because I think it's something like 13 Austrian steps to like eight French steps, but the terrain and the leadership will be a big factor in that decisive battle probably. Um, and then indeed, uh, Napoleon dropped Salt, picked up some units in uh, Picardy, uh, and is basically moving down and probably next... French activation will play the Boulogne camp and get him snaked over towards Ulm. Um, and that's really that's really it for activations. I also could have moved the Dutch, but uh, I don't think there's a real advantage to doing that. I should also point out that we did some diplomacy off camera. The British actually got lucky and got the Hansa to join up with them. They have no units, so this is maybe more of a liability at the moment, but um, it does give uh, the British an opportunity that, you know, they, they now have a, a buffer um, and could transport units over here if they wanted to. They're not necessarily in a good position to do it. Uh, France and Britain also tried to influence Prussia. Both failed, which was expensive. Both spent a lot of money out of their treasury. Their, their treasury left over from production from the previous unplayed year. Uh, is the way to look at that. And so not much on the on the diplomatic end, um, even for Prussia at the moment, but uh, France is making its movements. The very next activation will have to be coalition, and we can uh, imagine some sort of obvious activations here. I wanted to get the four chit out, because now we know that everybody else will get to activate somewhere along the way. We're not going to have any wasted uh, activations necessarily. We'll just choose to move everybody else when it makes the most sense. Now I will say just the way that this should go, because uh, again the game has been sort of set up to have a pretty good chance of, of providing for an Austerlitz situation. So what's going to happen probably is Mac comes to Radisbone, then he goes to Alm, he gets beat up, he retreats, the French uh, move into Austria, and then somewhere around here, uh, I'm not exactly sure which hex it would be considered for the actual battle of Austerlitz, but somewhere around here, there would be an army of Austrians that have finally met up with the uh, the Russians who are going to work their way down. So a combined army of Austrians and Russians will meet up here, and uh, after taking the end of the French, will defeat that force. That That would be the historical narrative. Now, whether it all plays out that way in our game, well, we'll see. But but the dumb rule, and when I say dumb, I don't think the rule is dumb. It's just it's making the Austrians dumb, is forcing Charles and Mac to maybe wander into a bad situation. But if that weren't the case, right, you could imagine this would be a very different scenario. Maybe worth playing out without these rules. Uh, I mentioned earlier that might be interesting. But here, you know, what you might expect is like, okay, these two prime Austrian armies will probably get defeated because the French are going to very likely get an advantage on them. And then the tail end of the campaigning season will be some battle between the French and the, and the Austro-Russians because whatever remnants are left of the Austrians will have t tagged up with the Russians. And for the Russians, it's going to take them activations, you know, several activations to get over here. 
um, to such a in, in such a state that they'll actually be able to fight uh, the the French. So um, you know everything here is a factor of distance and time and. If it works out the way, you know, it likely will be, we could see the historical thing. But anyway, we're going to, we're going to go to the cup. We're going to pull the next chit. It will have to be either a naval chit or a coalition land chit. Um, and I pulled uh, coalition land two, which means everybody but the worst units will be able to activate. Um, so... We'll take care of that. I, I will have to decide if I'm going to do these videos by basically chit impulse. If I do it that way, then we're basically only going to be able to do like one season per video probably with as much as I talk. I may just speed things up and we can knock out like a lot of 1805, then the next video would be 1806, 1807, and so on and so forth. Um, that may be better just for time's sake, but at least I want to show you guys this opening because uh, I think the opening matters a little bit more because you want to see, you know, that Austerlitz battle maybe come to fruition and just kind of see how the campaign evolves. But over time, things will be so mixed up and not quite to history just because of, you know, the butterfly effect uh, that it'll be just simpler to, to play through where you guys don't see everything um, or you don't see every activation shit. You really just see the output of uh, the seasons maybe. So, all right, I'm going to at least go take care of this coalition land ship. Okay, here we are with the first coalition activation. Just some minor movements here. Uh, the Neapolitan army is moving up to defend or try to take back Rome. Probably won't work. Um, the army of Italy only has enough movement points to get here without going into an extended movement. And I decided not to there because um, I'd rather... I'd rather not deal with the attrition. I don't want to deal with double the attrition, basically. Um, I don't know. Maybe this was a bad move. But we, we, we could have tried to attack, but uh, I chose not to. Um, <clears throat> uh, and then there is, um, you know, Mac did take Radisbone and is moving towards uh, Munich. Um, he kind of ran out of movement points. They don't have very many movement points, and I'm cautious of doing extended movement because these <clears throat> these armies are so big that they could very easily lose a lot of troops. And, and that's what kind of makes them ungainly, and of course, you know, Napoleon's going to take advantage of that. Um, and then finally, uh, well, I guess the British also moved over here a little bit just to threaten, not that they can do anything truly nefarious at this point. And finally, <clears throat> we had uh, Russians kind of curving this way. So this force from Kovno came to near Brest-Litovsk. And then these guys are, are filtering down, having to drop a supply train as a depot, uh, just due to the way that the movement, movement factors are working out, where uh, you actually, <clears throat> as the Russians, do need a supply depot right around here to complete the... Uh, the, the linkage, at least I think you do. Um, that's, that's what I did in the previous scenario with the Russians. So those guys are coming down. I did end up losing a step due to an extended movement, which I thought I could get away with, and I turned out to be wrong about that, which kind of makes it not good for the Russians very generally. Um, so kind of a straightforward move, nothing too crazy there. We're going to go uh, to the cup now, and uh, we'll get an Empire Land too. So most French units will get to move, or I should say French stacks will get to move. We'll also need to decide what to do with the Spanish um, because they could uh, start moving towards Lisbon, which they probably will try to do that. Um, and we'll see how well that works. Everywhere else, you know, there's some obvious axes of advance that we're going to follow. We'll probably use the Bologna camp card here and get Napoleon... Uh, much, much closer to Ulm, and then we'll go from there. Okay, here we are after the uh, second French activation. Um, I ended up running uh, Napoleon with the Bologna camp card into Ulm. He did take a little bit of attrition with extended movements, because I think you still have to have the, uh, the extended movement penalty attrition checks, but there's not one for activating a second time. And technically, it was a free activation, so in terms of the game rules, 
Napoleon's only activated once, um, which, which should mean I expect that the Austrian army will probably activate, attempt to get into Ulm, get defeated by Napoleon, and then when Napoleon goes again, he should be able to clean them up and then be in the fall, basically, um, be moving into Austria proper, and then we'll see if the Italian army does the same. What I could see happening is maybe the Austrians get the better of the French-Italian army, and that might draw off uh, Napoleon, but I think he, he probably can do reasonably well um, just getting into Austria and then being in a position to face off against the Russians. Um, so with that complete, we, we will go over to the uh, coalition now. And, oh, by the way, I should point out that the Spanish armies are moving to the west to deal with uh, Portugal. Nothing terribly exciting there otherwise. Um, and really, Britain's not in a position to help them out, at least until not the next year when they've had a chance to build more units. Um, all right, next chit coming out is... Oh, Empire Naval 1. Um, so this is our opportunity for Trafalgar. Uh, so in terms of the, the naval situation, the French have uh, one fleet there, not in great shape. There is a combined uh, fleet here from opposite Nelson, which, you know, that would be your, your opportunity to play the Nelson card, I guess. Um, and then there's a few other scattered Spanish fleets and then some... Uh, French fleets here and here that really, you know, it, it's a hard thing to figure out what they can do there. Um, here's the way to think about it. If, if we try to break out and we lose, no big deal, right? <laughs> like, like our strategy is France stays the same. Um, but if we do break out, or at least we defeat some of the British fleets, that, that's going to cause the British to need to maybe rebuild their fleets, spend some money, it's kind of a gambit. As soon as the French lose their fleet, the French are done with fleet matters and are really going to be prey to whatever else may come down from there. So I could definitely see it being worthwhile here. Um, so let me take care of the naval impulse. Um, we're clearly not going to be, you know, navally maneuvering uh, any amphibious assaults or anything. It's going to be purely, you know, uh, you know, ship v ship battle. Um, we'll at best, maybe we knock the Gulf of Lion open um, and give us a little bit of flexibility in the middle of the Mediterranean, but I, I think we're going to have a hard time here. So, yeah, let me uh, let me see what can be done with that. Okay, the uh, Empire Naval <clears throat> chit actually went much better than I might have thought. Um, so here... Uh, the French fleet chased the British out of the Gulf of Lyon and really ended up chasing them back into Gibraltar. Uh, and rather than, you know, try to blockade Gibraltar, which is certainly, you know, one option, um, I intended instead to stay in the, in the Western Med. Just, you know, the thing that we want to keep from happening is, a, is an easy uh, place for the coalition to try to invade France from the south, so at least holding the Med until other French fleets can get there and help. Uh, we did not try to break out against, uh, or we did try to break out against Nelson, but we retreated. Uh, it, it was close. I chose not to use the Nelson card because I figured like, well, why chance Nelson just dying? Um, he still won the fight against the French there, but it was just a retreat. So it, it's not as though he heavily defeated the French, just forced them to retreat. <clears throat> Elsewhere, we had the fleets come out of Russia Fort, destroyed two British fleets. It was a lopsided die roll, so basically not quite snake eyes, but but pretty nearly so for the British. And then I rolled nearly boxcars for the French, which enabled them to destroy <clears throat> two British fleets, which is a coup for them. Um, and then they managed to break the blockade at Brest, managed to get one fleet out here. The rest are still in Brest, and then these a, a collective set of British fleets uh, retreated to the North Atlantic for the moment. There was an attempt to relieve La Corona, and that failed um, with a retreat result for the French. So I guess the French are lucky in that they've managed to avoid losing any fleets, and inflicting two on the British is actually pretty great. Um, so this kind of opens up the possibility that if the French 
second naval chit comes out, <clears throat> they could take some of these guys and 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 actually maybe come over here and clear the channel, or at least keep the British at bay. Um, and if they get really fortunate, if they can find, um, you know, pick off British fleets where they can, they can heavily reduce the British fleet presence. So. I was thinking, you know, this would be an attempt and it, it would deflate pretty quickly, but uh, the French are off to a pretty good start, which which gives them the chance to make a difference here. Now, I'm, I'm not thinking I'm going to send Napoleon back over the, to the channel in the Boulogne camp at this point, but um, e even just shutting down the British fleets puts us in a good position to where um, we can really limit the ability of the British to uh, affect the game. And in fact, you know, if, if things go really well our way, we could potentially blockade uh, Britain somehow and keep them from getting trade value, which I think would be uh, very, very valuable. I need to figure out, you know, what that looks like uh, ultimately, but but we could do it. Uh, there's a there's a pathway to do it and that could hurt them uh, to some some good deep degree. So that's it for that. We're going to go to the cup. Oh. Dropped one out of the cup. All right, going back. And this is a summer turn, by the way, so there's no winter quarters. Uh, this campaign starts in summer. And we get uh, Empire Naval 2. I don't know if you can have two back-to-back -back naval chits. Let me look that up really quick. Okay, so it appears that the French can actually go again uh, with a naval impulse. So this is... It, the, the limitation on one side going and the other side has to go is apparently limited to land impulses. So this is actually um, a very critical, uh, very critical get, so to speak, because what it means is <clears throat> we have an opportunity to use our conjoined French fleets to very quickly um, smear out some of the weaker British uh, fleet groups. Um, and if we do well enough to completely eliminate those guys, then, um, well, it, they're going to be in some deep trouble um, that the British might be. It might put them at a bad disadvantage for, uh, for, the, for the terms. Nelson's still a really great leader, so they're always going to have Nelson and the card to maybe guarantee at least one victory. But this is really good for the French, like unbelievably good circumstances here where um, they're, they're able to do what they're doing. So... Um, we'll we'll see what we can do with this extra naval impulse. Does mean that the British will get two naval impulses back to back, so we need to keep that in mind. Like whatever the front or the British want to do with their naval impulses when they come up, they'll be able to do. So I'm not sure how much that's going to factor into what we do. I think we go for broke and try to destroy as many British fleets as we can. Well, um, I think we would call this a fortuitous first turn for the French. Um, and I can only tell you that I I have not seen dice rolls lopsided so badly since my recent game of Wit, <laughs> where, um, gosh, the French have done very well for themselves. Uh, Nelson is in fact dead. Now, it's hard it because this all happened. You know, units were moving all over the place. It's it's kind of hard to tell you exactly. You know, to retell the exact set of things that occurred but but basically what we have here is a british fleet that is blockaded at gibraltar with a decent french fleet uh we have a spanish and a french fleet off cape st vincent that is kind of fielding against uh this lone portuguese uh, naval unit um we've also moved off one of the spanish navies out to kind of uh, be a uh, uh, block against the uh, Neapolitan fleet or anybody else that might come out to play. Um, and then uh, here, the French fleet have chased the British fleet uh, out of the channel. Now, there's still a potent fleet here and, and a fleet that is blockading Amsterdam. Um so it's not as though the, the British are totally out of it. They also have a fleet that retreated to uh, Plymouth. Um, 
but gosh, there's, yeah, there's a fleet in the channel. There's a fleet in the Bay of Biscay overall, basically, um, it is looking really good from a naval perspective. You might ask how the hell this occurred, and I, I don't know how to explain it other than the die rolls went hard in favor of the French, like unbelievably hard. And in, in, in fact, um, we have had four fleet units destroyed by the British, um, or I'm sorry, four units destroyed of the, of the British, one of the leaders rolled boxcars and is out of the game, which is why he's up up there with Nelson. And then, of course, Nelson died. Nelson died because we had a battle, you know, the last battle that the French really worried, you know, had, had been concerned with. Um, and after this battle, there was a few other minor maneuvers completed, um, was basically to uh, deal with the fleet um, watching over Cadiz and in a bizarre battle uh it, it was close and so this is this is what i had decided to do so um i kind of cheated but i cheated in favor of the coalition so we we had a fight and it was the the french versus the british and i rolled very well as the french um very well. It was like a six and a six and like a five and then the other, the bonuses from the fleet commanders. And before I even rolled the, the British, I was thinking, okay, there's, I, it almost doesn't matter what the British are going to roll. They're going to lose and they might end up losing um, some ships. And I don't want that to happen because then Nelson would be by himself and he could be, you know, defeated by himself and be outnumbered and like, just, it was bad. So I said, okay, if it's this bad, I will go ahead and decide to use the card. It's not clear to me when you're supposed to play the Nelson card, if you're supposed to play it before the battle um, or, or what. Like if you look at the card text, this is a fleet commanded by Nelson rolls one extra die in battle. I suppose I should play this like before the dice start being rolled. But I, I, I decided like, again, cheating for the coalition. I said, uh-oh. They're in trouble. I better play this card and just, just allow them to play it. And I played it, and it didn't matter. The extra die roll wasn't enough to make that big of a difference. Um, and then when I rolled the die that was going to maybe kill Nelson, it did, in fact, kill him. Um, so Nelson is dead, and then the, the remaining British fleet uh, retreated, and I had them retreat to, uh, to Gibraltar because it just... They didn't really have anywhere else to go that was safe enough, I guess, is one way to look at it. And uh, they're they're stuck. And so uh, this is just one of those extreme situations. Every the, the, the French haven't won every naval battle. They've had naval battles where they had to retreat and then they couldn't go back to where they lost the battle. Um, but the French haven't lost any units. So every battle that they've lost has been within the one to three points where they just have to retreat. But when the British have lost, they've lost badly enough due to wide ranging in the die rolls where you know, one side's rolling like ones and twos on their dice and the other's rolling fives and sixes. That, that you know, you can see they've lost a, really a grand total in terms of counters on the board, five fleets. Five fleets. Um... And uh, that's extreme. And when you think about how expensive it is to build a fleet, that's, what, 100, 100 production? Just gone. Just gone. Now, I had mentioned before, the British naval impulse markers, both of them are still in the chit. I had both sides put their extra naval marker in this turn because it's summer and we know everything is going to get played, so we'll, we'll use this to the maximum effect. We could have used you know, those chits to maybe try to do some amphibious invasion, get some reinforcements to, to Portugal or something. It, now, it's purely a question of, can the the British Navy try to clear the French out, um, restore control over the channel so that Britain is not uh, at risk, and try to get the situation under control? They'll have two naval impulses to do it with, which means that, like, they're not going to be interrupted they don't have to be necessarily back-to-back, -back, but 
um, they, they can at least try to make something happen. They've got some opportunity. It's just that their, their present fleets with which to work with um, might not be enough. Uh, and if, if a die roll goes badly, then they're going to be in even worse shape than they were. So I, I think the British can still get out of the situation, but it is tough. And it's funny because I was talking crap about the idea of invading Britain but if I had committed to that, I didn't know that the dice were going to go this way, but if I had committed to that and left Napoleon in the Boulogne camp, he actually would be crossing the Straits and moving into Britain. Um, I think it's too late to worry about that right now, but if the French remain in control of the channel and can maintain a naval advantage, um, this could actually be very bad news for Britain, and we could actually win the camp campaign game based on that. Um, if we can get, let's say, in the spring of 1806, build up a army with Salt, who is going to cross the channel, and they can maintain, you know, the French can basically maintain control and, and shut down the rest of the British Navy, then, oh boy, they're going to be in trouble. So, a very unsurprising turn of events, guys. Like, I, I doubt that this would normally happen. The, the dice have been extreme. Um, is it possible that the British can come back from this? Yes. But the loss of five naval units is expensive, and it's going to be very hard uh, for them to get, you know, back up to full strength. And, and again, if the French can manage to um, win some significant victories uh, to come, if they just if they get lucky again, if they can denude the British fleet down to nothing, um, that really changes the game a lot, um, and really puts the game, you know, in in the French favor by a lot. No matter what's happening on the land theater. The theater that the British are supposed to be the masters of, seeing them crumble tilts the game a lot. Anyway, um, well, let's pull the next shit and just see what we get. And we got uh, Empire Land 3, which we can't use. Uh, the last land shit was an Empire shit. So we'll pull... Okay, so we get the... Uh, let's see if we can... Yeah, anyway, it's the Coalition Land 4. So uh, I'm not sure how many leaders actually can uh, move on that. There may only be a small handful. Um, so I'll take care of that and we'll keep going. Okay, I want to show a couple of chit results here. Um, the Coalition Land 4 ultimately just amounted to the uh, Austrian army of Italy trying to get into Mantua and were pushed back. Uh, they lost a fight. They did not get demoralized, but the losses were too... Step losses for each side. It's just the French got a two plus result, which forced them to retreat. Um, and I mean, basically, the uh, um, the French are they technically are lower on the force ratio there, but they had better terrain um, and and kind of better bonuses. They did lose a leader to being wounded. So whether or not the Italian front's going to collapse for the Austrians is kind of unknown yet. <clears throat> Elsewhere, uh, the next chit drawn was one of the coalition naval chits, and we basically had two battles of significance, or one, I don't know what you call it, but so they tried to break out here, they failed, they retreated, they were kind of done. Um, here, they uh, basically chased a French fleet out of the channel where there was a lot of back and forth and, and repeated pursuit combats, but the die rolls never, uh, the die roll differential was never greater than three. So the French kind of just got chased around a bit. Um, eventually the British ran out of gas, lost a battle, retreated to the channel because they were actually fighting over here uh, at that point, and um, they stopped there. So technically the, the British, I mean, I don't know what you want to call it, a tactical defeat, but a strategic victory in that while they did not destroy the French fleet or harm it enough, they did get a better position, which is restoring control of the channel, uh, which puts the threat of direct invasion of the British Isles off for the moment, and at least off for the summer because the French are out of naval chits. So the British feel good about that. If they get another... Uh, another naval chit, they're probably not going to move this fleet. They may move, you know, some of these units around a little bit differently to uh, to try to 
um, again, break out down here or do something else. But that worked out for them. Uh, I did draw the next chit, which, ha which happens to be the Empire 3 chit, which there should be plenty of action uh, there for that. And in fact, um, Napoleon may be able to, to jump on Mac before he even gets to Munich, which could very well be what happens here. So, um, and, and maybe we'll see an assault on the Austrian position there to kind of open up the southern flank. Uh, but I'll take care of that chit and we'll show the results. Okay, here we are after the uh, Empire Plan 3 chit. A um, couple of minor things uh, up in the Hansa. Uh, the French Corps uh, have taken those fortresses. They've reactivated them. This puts the capital of Hansa under threat. It kind of, you know, it's like, well, the British brought the Hansa in. Could have been advantageous, but now it's too busy fighting for its life in the naval battles, um, which is just giving the French an opportunity to seal up that front there. Um, and probably at some point just get Denmark on their side, uh, though everyone's kind of lost, you know, lost a lot of money trying to influence things. Uh, especially important, Napoleon did surge forward, use the flank march to catch Mac, and uh, destroyed his army, eliminated it. He did the maximum die result on a major battle, and then in the demoralization, the rest of the Austrian army was finished off. Uh, Napoleon did suffer three step losses for it, so he's taken a little bit of a, a punch there. But he's still got a lot of staying power. Um, and, and basically has the opportunity to start heading right into Austria with very little uh, in front of him to stop him. Though the Russians are trying to make their way down, they just haven't made it yet. Um, what would be very, really important... Napoleon is to get uh, the army of Italy coming through as well, uh, but they're just too advent, you know, like they have too much of a disadvantage trying to cross the river against the Austrians, so they're figuring they might as well wait into the fall. That army still has to try to get into Mantua and maybe win on the defense or at least be put out of position. Um, because at this point, I mean, all, all that Napoleon really has to worry about doing is try to get... Um, something just here to block Innsbruck or send a core or two down to defeat that reserve force and then send the rest of his army. Um, he's going to have to take, you know, one of these fortresses again. Uh, but then, you know, kind of head, head over to Vienna, probably take Vienna and then be prepared to take on the Russians. So it, it we're not totally out of sorts here, but um, we're definitely going to have to uh, be careful with our movements out in that open terrain uh, where the Russians could actually cause some trouble for us. Uh, may, may have to spread out the Grand Army, actually, to, to be able to do all the things that we're going to need to do. Um, so, yeah, there you go. The, the battle did have some card usage. So uh, the Austrians got rivalry that they were able to play, but the French got flank attack and skirmishers, which really you know, came, came in handy and just caused a, a complete uh, destruction of that uh, army of the Rhine. So um, pretty good pretty good shape so far. Um, Napoleon just has the ability to, to throw out a lot of modifiers across the whole army um, and, and can just, uh, just make the battles very difficult for uh, the enemy. So if he can keep doing that um, and keep shutting down the rest of these Russian armies, then... Uh, you know, we, we will probably see a historical result here where we knock Austria clear out of the war. Um, they, they really don't have much to fight on now. Like, their only force of significance is their army of Italy. They've got a couple of detachments uh, out here that aren't going to do much. You know, they're basically single step that are going to get crushed. So it's really going to come down to are the Russians strong enough as they march down to, uh, to make any sort of difference, um, and that is going to be a pretty big question. They're also leaving themselves a bit open. If the Prussians join the French somehow, where they've really only got one force uh, up here in the north hanging out, so if the, the Russians are, are crushed too easily, um, that could be a major issue. Uh, but we'll go uh, pull from the cup and see what else happens next. Okay, the last couple of chits that got played out were uh, the Empire and Coalition 
uh, landmarkers where really, really not much more um, could take place. You know, a lot of the armies that have been activated were activated. Uh, and even, well, I guess what I could have done, this would be like the one exception would be to try to get Yo Johan over here or something to try to uh, organize a new defense um, but uh, that would be that would be it I guess and kind of give up on Innsbruck and just hope that uh, uh, he can do something I guess that, that would have been the only other move um, and I'll allow myself to make it because I can um, and then there was a naval activation uh the last naval activation for the coalition another attempt to break out here failed but no losses which was good and then uh, in the north the british did try to swing down here and see if they could disrupt this fleet because they had the advantage on the modifiers but they actually ended up losing and they lost a fleet uh retreated to the channel and then one that was in port came back to join it so once again, um, a, a kind of a failure on the British Navy, and right now it looks like it's going to be very difficult for Britain to kind of bounce back uh, this year. Maybe next year with production they can build some more more boats, but they've got to hold the channel. Um, and in the fall, what could happen is that you know they're, each side's only going to have one naval marker, but that would be the French opportunity to try to, to finish off the, the fleets and uh, put Britain under direct threat, which would be valuable. And everything else is kind of moving along here. And that's it for the summer of 1805. Um, this is going to be a pretty decent-sized video already, so I think I'm going to cut it here, and we'll go into the fall turn in the next video. I might just try to move through things faster and do less explanation and try to do all of fall and winter in the next video and just get through the rest of 1805 and get into the uh, 1806. But as we stand here, um, the uh, Italian uh, theater is still uncertain, still more fighting to be done. In the uh, German theater, uh, South German theater, you know, Napoleon has uh, eliminated an Austrian army entirely and is now going to be marching into Austria proper um, to face off against the Russians as they start to filter down and try to figure something out. Um, and then uh, we talked about the naval battles. The British Navy is uh, on its heels at the moment, um, being put in a very difficult situation. And uh, in the north, there's uh, some French uh, forces that are going to be heading to Hamburg to finish off the Hansa, which is really an incidental uh, minor country situation that we're not too worried about. But that's it. Uh, thank you guys for watching. Um, oh, actually, before we, before we finish up, I just want to show the uh, the Alliance credit. So obviously the Austrian Alliance credit is starting to drop. They started at 10. They lost one for the uh, loss of the uh, city of Rome for their minor country, the papacy. Then they lost two for having a major defeat that demoralized their army. And then another one for uh, the army marker actually being destroyed. So they're technically down to six, which feels really high. Um, and technically, Russia lost one uh, because of the uh, Allied uh, army marker being uh, eliminated, I think. Um, or was it... Uh... Might have to look at that again. Oh, ma major victory or defeat in which you're, we didn't actually participate. So they, they lost one for that. Uh, but that's it. I think that's the only one that they, that they lost. So... Technically, Russia's still feeling like they're in it. Again, I feel like they have so many points, it's really hard to understand how you bring it all the way down to zero. So I'm a little worried about that, um, but we'll we'll see. Uh, anyway, um, yeah, so thanks for watching, guys. That's this, the first turn of the Grand Campaign, if we continue to play it as the Grand Campaign, and we'll see you in the next video. Thanks for watching.